Praise the Lord. It's good to be back with the brethren and in the Word of God. Praise the Lord. We've been working on the power of a new consecration and how with that reconsecrated life to God, the power of the Holy Ghost flowing through us, we can overcome sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's always been God's plan that his son Jesus would come to destroy the works of the devil. You and I, beloved, we've been born again from above. We've been washed in the blood. And we're setting out on this trio to Calvary's Hill. Jesus had said, follow me. I, for one, intend to go up that hill to Calvary. I don't have that strength, but in my consecration, in that veneration of my mind to the Christ, in my love of the Jesus, with him in I, and the unrivaled and equaled power of the Holy Ghost, you and I can go up that hill. We must take up our cross and follow him. This is the message that causes the problems when we talk about our cross. Today we live in the absence of sanctification, which is consecration, which is holiness, which is separation, we live in a time, in an age, that the church has gone playing instead of praying. When we come to services, people want to say about celebrations. Well, celebrating the new birth is wonderful, and I'm into celebrating Christ resurrected in you and I. But you know, it's the Lord's heart. You say, how do you know that I pray? I fast. I talk to God. God has let me know that it's out of balance. He's sick and tired of being sick and tired of hearing about celebrations when there's not enough lamentations. If we can get it right, celebrate the greatness of this Christ and lamentations for all that goes on that ought not to. Lamentations for the lost. Crying and weeping, let the priests and the brethren weep before the porch and the altar. God is weeping over the state of the church. Yes, certainly over the bondage of the sinners. But now when they come in, what do they find? Lukewarm, he said so. Left their first love, he said so. Fallen, backsliding, he said so. A falling away in the last days, he said so. I am not in these series of messages on a new consecration ever intending to bring to you anything of my own thought, anything of my own writing, though I've never wrote a book, but anything of my own little scratch pad, I do not want ever to bring anything of that to you. I want to bring to you that which can be found, substantiated, and confirmed in the written word of God. This is your safety, that you know what your preacher says. It's been quoted like this. The Bible says, if you have that, you can take an afternoon of seeking God by the river and read your word. How wonderful. Now, the last message to planet Earth before the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ in the rapture for the saints is to be ye holy for I am holy. Holiness from the book of Hebrews, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. No man. We must be holy. Also, he said, be at peace with all men and holiness. So just trying to be peaceful is not exactly all of it, and trying to live holy in an exterior form is not all of it. There must be that interior part of repentance between man and man, between brothers and sisters in the body, and of course between thou and me and the Lord Jesus Christ. An interior peace. My peace I give to you, not as the world giveth, but I give unto you my peace. 
There must be the interior taken care of. Then the exterior. Do I look holy? Or is half of my daughter's clothes left in the closet? Some people let so-called saints, their children go out in less clothes than you'd be comfortable with your daughter going to bed as pajamas in. The world has taken over the church and instead of the church converting the world and inviting her to the supremacy of Christ, they have lowered the standard to get the crowds. The big music, the lights, some have smoke bombs, theater, mine, art, drama, all to attract a crowd. Jesus Christ is in none of that. I find him this wise in the Bible, wounded, lonely, forsaken, persecuted, suffering. And unto these, brethren, beloved, he invites us to attain. What are we doing? Running from the flavor of the month club to the flavor of the month club. Once again, not to be labor point, but lamentations over and above lamentations. What about prayer and fasting and weeping and seeking? And if we don't seek God, we'll never be consecrated. So consecration then moves on from just the holiness, uh, looking right and not half naked and half drunk on the curse of this life. Holiness moves on from consecration, sanctification, and holiness to the final part we discussed is service. Take my life and let it be consecrated unto thee. Moving away now from the personal part on the person to the personhood of Christ on the theme of go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. On the part of witnessing, tracting, conducting Bible studies, helping street preachers, on the part of service. All of this now is brought up and rolled up into one, the mantle of going forth in service. What service are you doing in your consecration for the Lord? Of a Saturday morning do you go out with a fist full of tracks? Do you teach your children how to stand on the corner of W. H. Smith or the local news agent? And as the men and women come out with their magazines and newspaper, hand them a track. Outside the movie theater, hand them a track. Going into the pub, hand them a track. Do you encourage your family to be involved in the last outreach to planet Earth? Or is it another movie? Is it another game of these beep, 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 beep controllers watching the screen playing these war and combat games? What is it with God's people that they're not excited, turned on about working with Jesus? Not working for them. The church is great at doing some little works sprinkling a little Jesus confetti on top and saying, the Lord told me. You'll know whether the Lord told you or not if it lines up with the scripture. We're not here to work for Jesus, doing stuff, doing things. We're here to work with him, meaning, he said, follow thou me, meaning following him in the tree, following him in the way, meaning let him lead us, meaning as many as are led by the Spirit, meaning I will follow you wheresoever thou leadest. He's going to lead in the last times as in days before, he's going to lead us in the Word. He's going to lead us to make a stand for come out in the last days. Now our message, a new consecration, our thought then today, under that title, is a calling out. If ever God did anything with, to, for, and through his people, 
It was to call them out of what they were in. Now they're always in some trouble. They were always in a quagmire of filth and religion. And so he calls them out to a new consecration. Most of that will have to be physically, come out physically. It's hard to change in a church that's backslid unless revival, and it's possible, sweep through that church, that local body. God calls us out when the elders and the pastor won't change. Don't run out, make an appointment. Explain why they're not in the scripture. Explain how you're disappointed, uh, unsatisfied, or seriously afraid of the twisting of the scriptures. The making them say one thing when the Greek does not concur with it. Make an appointment. Give the man of God an opportunity to make it right. Just don't go running off. Go and do it the right way. That's what I've done. That's what I recommend along this pathway of life. Make an appointment and explain. Here today we have ecumenism. All churches meeting. That's not in the scripture. That's not right. We can't meet, mix, and play with the Roman Catholics. The Pope says it's still salvation through the church. That Mary is the mother of God. Now God is and always was and always will be a spirit. God has no mother. God has no mother. God is a spirit. And they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. The truth is, Mary needed saved the same as any other lass here on this planet. Mary was never the mother of God. She was the mother of Jesus. Jesus, the saver of the world, is high and above everything of any other planet or nature. Not that there's any other planets of consequence. But you know what I mean. We cannot give it our twist. And today they're twisting things. God has no mother. They're lifting the Blessed Mary, Virgin Mary, as they call her, up to be co redemptist mixing with the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church, the Catholic Church, the Pentecostal Church, the Baptist Church, and on and on and on. It's called, I hate mixture, saith the Lord. Come ye out and be separate, and touch not the unclean thing. Rome does not, and according to the scriptures, Revelation, the last book, never will preach salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Rome does not know straight up one time the true pathway of biblical salvation. It's prayers, novenas, scapulars, holy water, on and on. None of that's in the Bible, neither is purgatory. You do not go somewhere else when you die to be purged. You're either saved or you're lost. A woman is never a little bit pregnant. And the mix and match is not holiness. The Bible says, come out. So you would never dare have gone into a Catholic church. You'd never dare have any of this stuff with the Mormons, the way called international or Jehovah's Witnesses, but yet you would go in to this ecumenical movement, all churches together, and there sits supreme, the priest, the nun. We're not anti-Catholic. We are truth producers. I am a Protestant, not as an opposite to Catholic, but as an opposite to everything that won't protest. I'm opposite to Methodist. I'm opposite to Baptist. They don't protest. Why would I go with the Methodists? They lost John Wesley's protest. Why? I'm a Protestant, not a Catholic. Not concerned about that sense, but the sense of protestant. 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 I protest that. I protest that. And it's not just the Catholic Church. We in holiness following the Holy Ghost, which is why 
He's called the Holy Ghost. I'm protesting other things. Everything that's not scripture, not scriptural, not biblically sound. What do you think, sister? Guess what we do? We protest it all. Why is that? It said it to do that in this book. Touch not the unclean thing. What do you think Scripture twisted is? What do you think Scripture wrongfully applied is? It's unholy. It's unclean. And it's devastating to the young Christian. So we are to come out first of that whore, the great harlot of Revelation 17. The Roman Catholic Church, the woman that sits in seven hills. You say, well, there's seven hills in Argentina. I concur. But in Argentina, on their seven hills, it was not on the Roman mintage of coin. The River Tiber does not run 12 miles past that leader or this pope's palace. It does, but not that leader. Those people never persecuted, hung, drawn, and quartered, and burnt, and raped the Protestant saints, this church, the Roman church, did and has never repented of yet. Now, the modern-day ecumenical movement, which now contains Church of God, Church of God of Christ, Church of God of Prophecy, Assembly of God, and on and on, all roads lead to Rome. God said, Now come ye out from amongst them. When do you come out? Now. When's now? Well, it's past then. Then when we should have come out. Now, beloved, watching or listening by whatever means, you're hearing it for the final time. You come out. You suffer persecution. You honor God by going up the hill with your cross. Forget about everyone else's cross. Forget about mom and pop and what Bible they're reading. You stick to the King James. Do not read, do not read the NIV, the nearly inspired version. In there they have changed it. In the book of Acts, Paul comes up on the saints and he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? A time subsequent to believing. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed. They said we didn't even know there'd be a Holy Ghost. How shameful, how terrible. And that's the way the church is today. Oh, we got the Holy Spirit when we were born again. He came inside and there is no subsequent action. There's no second blessing. Not so, says God's book. Paul said, have you received the Holy Ghost since? A subsequent action, a second blessing, and they said, no. He laid hands on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And they did and began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Everyone should have the right to hear the question asked of them. In love, a wonderful question. People should just be dying, get the pun on dying, just be dying to get asked, Have you received the Holy Ghost? Because when you say yes, you own up to your need. Because before they went out preaching, he said, tarry ye here in Jerusalem, in that upper room. Do not go out until he comes. Yes, the Holy Ghost is now termed and looked upon as a person in the Trinity. Not just a movement, not just an it, not just a manifestation. But when he comes, a person, he will guide you into all truth. You'd think everybody would want to have this pathway to all truth when he comes. Not before, when he comes. And so when they received the Holy Ghost, they did more than speak in tongues. The Bible said that they had this love. The love of God was shed abroad in their heart by the Holy Ghost. Praise God for tongues. I speak in other tongues. But I'm more definitely looking for the love of Jesus. You may speak in tongues, but you better have love. 
Love will operate your faith. Don't listen to Kenneth Copeland telling you, have faith in your faith. That's a bad doctrine. That is a suicidal statement. Have faith in God. When he comes, he guides you into all truth. You begin to really understand, by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of works, and that what's not the faith, and that what's not the grace. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The very faith to get saved was a gift. You didn't have that faith, and subsequently, you don't have faith of your own. It's the faith of God. Now, the great apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.20, This life I now live in the flesh, in the body that sits in nature. This life I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith of, not in. The faith of, not in. I live it by the faith of, of the Son of God, the same faith that came to save you has to come and baptize you in the Holy Ghost, has to lead you, heal you, and guide you. That may be called saving faith, faith that may be called healing faith. The point I'm making is it comes daily, hourly, momentarily at the point of asking or the need. It's the faith of God. So, we need this faith of God, asking God to give us the strength and power to come out and be separate, to be a separate people, not be found with the mix and match crowd. In Pentecost here in the United States and in the United Kingdom, it used to be you'd know Holy Ghost churches. You'd know Holy Spirit baptized and filled people. They were kind, peaceful, gentle, long-suffered, patient, and they distributed their goods. The Bible said when the Holy Ghost come in the book of Acts, the evidence was love. Then they did speak in tongues. In Romans it said, the love of God shed abroad in the heart by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came in Acts and shed this love. In Galatians it says, faith that worketh by love. You don't need more faith. You need to love God more. You and I, Brethren, we need more love. Faith which worketh by love. Galatians chapter 5. Now, in this love of God, and obedience comes in love, they shared their goods. Acts 2 and Acts chapter 4. In those two chapters, neither did any call what they owned to be their own. But they had all things in common. Whoever had a need, it was satisfied. The Bible will also go on to say, and none had lack. Seems to me the richer in the church gets richer, and everyone else has lack. The first one to get rid of his lack is the preacher. As regards the finances, he gets a house paid by cash. You take a mortgage. He gets a car paid by cash. You get a line of credit. I'm saying, brethren, the summit not right. It ain't wrong with God. It ain't wrong with his word. And it ain't wrong with the true apostles and those folks leading the charge in the end time. It's wrong with them preachers who are greedy for gain. They're covetous. We discussed before that covetous people were sinners. It's a sinner's gospel. They should be put out. You put a drunkard out, but not a covetous. And covetous people, those that are drunk in the curse of this life, Jesus said, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Thank God that hardness is not upon us. But it's harder for a rich man to get in. You'd think he'd get rid of the hardness, wouldn't you? You'd think he'd widen the gate. Well, you can't widen the narrow gate. You have to get rid of the stuff so you can get through it. When you come to the narrow gate pathway, you have to lay everything down to go through. And when you get to the other side of the gate, you discover that that too is narrow. The same width as, oh yes, the gate. So strive, 
dirty word this in charismatic terms. Terrible word in charismatic fool blown churches. Strive? Why, we're just with Tiny Tim. Tiptoe through the tulips, tiptoe through the tulips with me. Pulling the wagon off a lot of dough in it. You know, do re me 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 bless me and mine with a heavy accent on the dough. This is the church today. They went playing instead of praying. Most of them's down in the golf course. That's why you can't find them for the outreach. I'm saying it's a terrible thing in the last days to find somewhere where you will not get ambushed and deceived. You are actually safe, but that will be for another day, another message in the wilderness. You're safer out in the wilderness. You're safer out there where the Lord is with his miracle water from the dry dust sand. We'll go there another time at the Lord's pleasing. But here we are now in this consecration. And our thought was a calling out. God is calling everybody out of everything that's not right. Now, if you find a good church, support it prayerfully, systematically, financially, go on the right reaches, do everything that the pastor and the brothers involved in. But if it's not good, after you've gone, go with one, go with two, tell the church, get out. It may be a while before you find a church or a little Bible study here or there are two or three Christians praying one night a week in Grandma's parlor. But find it. For your own safety, find it. The reason we come out, the reason we get this final consecration, the reason that we go on now with Jesus is not only for others but to keep ourselves. The Bible said to keep yourself in the love of God. The devil hates you hates God's church, and he's trying to take the pure, bona fide love from the brethren. It's love to share your goods. It's love to sell all. Jesus recommended this. Kind sir, what must I do to inherit the kingdom? Go sell all and give it to the poor. You know, some of the poorest people are church people. The Bible said in Galatians again, marvelous book Galatians, very instructive, it said, praying for all men, especially those of the household of the faith. Yes, we believe in praying for Israel. We certainly do. We do, yes, believe in praying for the Jewish folk. We certainly do. But not before, not in a higher priority than praying for the saints. They haven't bowed the knee to Christ. The saints have. Praying for all men, Gentile and Jew, Protestant and Catholic, Hindu, Baha, Islam, for all peoples, praying for all peoples. Especially, what does that do to your reckoning when you run it on the red tape as a study, a word study? Especially, especially the household of the faith. There's one that's not preached too often. Therefore, the especially is first added to and for the saints at the church in Jerusalem when the Holy Ghost come and spread like wildfire. Thousands in one day were saved. They knew instantly they didn't need my six tapes and Gloria's six other tapes to explain my eight on faith. Gloria Copeland's six on how to turn your faith loose. You know, the six tips is $50 and the three, uh, the other set uh, is $30, is $80. You can buy your children underwear and sneakers for yourself for their feet. Making merchandise, the Bible said. I said, the Bible said they will. That's prophetic. And that's prophetic. They will make merchandise of you. Have you ever felt like just plain old merchandise? I have. I've been merchandised and they got away with it. 
no more. God grows us up. He wants to grow you up, educate you, and mature you. So here we have a church distributing things, and none had lack. And they learned to distribute. And when they went out to preach the gospel, guess which and what gospel they preached? The one they had received. Then all the known earth had the gospel, not a gospel, the gospel of the book of Acts. Over here was Jesus and his wonderful teachings for three and a half years. Now, he said, I must go away, but I will send another one. What? There's another one? There's three of them? Oh, we are so blessed. Our Father, our Son, and the Holy Spirit. What have you got? Just two? We're of the third kind. Amen? The Holy Ghost. He said, I will send another one, and he'll guide you into all truth. And the truth of the matter is, God never changed his pattern of the book of Acts church. Man did that. David got the pattern of the temple. He wasn't allowed to build it. His son Solomon would build the temple. But he got the pattern. Who got the pattern for the building of the temple? Who got the pattern? David. Who gave David the pattern to build the temple? God. God said to him, be careful that thou doest as the pattern says. This is passed on to Solomon. Yes, the very same pattern passed on to the lineage. Guess what Solomon built? A temple according to David's pattern, the instructions from the kingdom of God. The Holy Ghost come and led and guided into all things at Pentecost, but it happened so quick we might as well agree it was the next thing to instant. And it said they all had everything in common. They had a revelation, ah yes, not of faith, but of the love of God. The love of God worked that faith. Galatians chapter 5. It's faith that worketh by love. Once again, you and I don't need any more faith. We need more love of God. So here comes the Holy Ghost with the pattern. Be sure, Holy Spirit, you show the apostles and the elders and the deacons and the saints the pattern. And the pattern comes and they begin to speak in tongues and have love and divers miracles. Stupendous things happen but they never forgot to distribute their goods. We, we, we'll make a line to suppose, you know, you forgot. And such a thing. How could you? But God is gracious. Would you like to repent of forgetting to distribute your goods now? Or wait to the end of service? There is no time to wait, for now is the hour of salvation. The Bible tells, be ye therefore ready for in such an hour, one hour, not a month or a year. The church needs to get back to old-fashioned pattern Holy Ghost revival. We have the pattern. Your word of God. This is yours. Men died to convey this word to you. You can have a copy for yourself. This is your security to check out what I have said. We're willing to stand and bleed and hand up our lives for this word. So help us God. This is the original gospel being preached. Salvation by the blood, sanctification, electrification, or the baptism of the Holy Ghost will electrify you. Separation, come out, holiness, service. That is why we call it on our tracks, on the streets of London, Dublin, Atlanta, and Charleston, 
the full gospel. If there be any other, God will show us extra to add to, but never to take away. The church at large, beloved, has taken away from God's word. He's not pleased. Is he angry? Most definitely, yes. He said, don't do this. And guess what they did? They did that. Is he angry? Don't ask it too many times. So Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. One will win. Either you'll hate one and serve the other. You know the story Jesus told. You cannot. Now what part of cannot don't we understand? You cannot serve two masters. In 1 John 2.15 it said, love not the world. We're not to be worldly. For all that is of the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of life, the pride of life, is not of the Father. Let's run immediately to 1 John. In the scripture now, moving to 1 John. Thank you, Jesus. 1 John 2.15 Love not the world, neither the things, please note the word things, that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Let's not argue with the scripture and say, well, I have extenuating circumstances. God is not listening. I'm sorry. I tried that. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why do we keep saying, oh, but they love the Lord. Oh, but she loves the Lord. According to this, if she loves the world, the love of the Father is not in her. She says it is. She demands it is. You confirm that it is. He said the way to know whether it is or not if they love the world. You cannot serve two masters. I'm not saying of occasion a little worldly here or there, a little worldly appetite, a little worldly hire for purchase. No, no, no. A patterned, deliberate walk. Worldly, worldliness. For all that is in the world. How do you get your head round? This is difficult, I know. How do you get your head round for all that? Is in the world, he begins to help by description. The lust of the flesh, sometimes you feel it crawling over you. You're lusting, you feel it. Wanting whatever the item is. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, what you see. But God said he would lead you by my own eyes. He wants us to meditate and think on that which is good, holy, pure, and lovely. If there be any virtue in these, think on these things. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Picture Kenneth now on the platform, either one. Hagen, when he was here, or Copeland, will do. Hand on hip, strutting, 